Mayor, you're muted. Mayor. Okay, I'll start over. Now, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Forgot uh -huh. that when I muted everybody, that included me too. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Welcome to Saturday morning training. Happy Halloween to everyone. And um, it's appropriate that we do this on Halloween because I call my program Better Than Magic because it is better than magic because your results are real. And so if you pay attention, leave your inhibitions your, and come open-minded and just, just say that, you know, what's possible, um, your results will be real too. So better than magic is the art of getting what you want. I'll even, I'll even stay after and uh, answer questions um, because I know you guys will have some. So I'm happy to stick around and answer questions for you. But kudos to you for taking the time to be here on a Saturday morning. I don't know if it's sunny where you are, but here it's a beautiful day. Happy Halloween. My mission today is to empower you, to inspire you to take positive action, deliberate action, and get what you want. And uh, with everything, you need to start where you are. So you are right here right now. And I'd love to begin this way because um, one of my favorite Zen expressions is when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And I'm so honored to be your teacher today. You must be ready because here you are. And then my, one of my gurus is uh, Louise Hay. I love her. She's all about positive affirmations. She started her own publishing empire when she was 60. And uh, this second quote is from her, all that I ever need to know at any given moment is always revealed to me. And I like to add in perfect timing because timing is always perfect. So I invite you to sit back, take a deep breath, and just uh, enjoy. The story of Jack Hill. I know today is going to feel like such a Jack Hill brag fest. And while I do admit I am a proud mom, I've taught these principles to my boys since they were old enough to understand, and Jack is such an amazing student. I'm going to show you the ways that he's used these tools to enhance his life. Uh, tools so simple that a 10-year-old can understand them, but how he's grown with them and how they still, 13 years later, um, enhance his life and make it better and it's the art of getting what you want so the story of jack hill when he was 10 years old he wanted a game Bo a game boy handheld device before cell phones that's what he wanted and it was in july there was no gift giving opportunities for jack um, his birthday was a month away christmas was obviously many months away and so i started teaching him this in order to for him to attract his Game Boy. He's 10 years old. I told him to write it down and request it because you have to ask for what you want. So he wrote it down and he mailed it because he had to release it. And um, he then, this was on a Monday. Yes, it was. It was on a Monday. And he had eight days before he was leaving and he wanted this Game Boy for a long distance trip. So on Monday, he he wrote his letter requesting his Game Boy and put it in the mail, and, and now he's just waiting. And I think at 10 years old, he truly believed that this Game Boy was just going to land in his lap. And so part of, and I will, I will break this story down and we'll go through all the pieces, but part of what he had to do is he had to stay in his joy. That's the way I call it. As you, he, I told him he couldn't cop an attitude with me. He had to behave himself. He couldn't fight with his brothers. He just had to be good. So by Friday... He was really getting antsy, like, where is my Game Boy? Where is my Game Boy? He really expected that it would appear by then. And Jack has always been, and he still is, somebody who works really, really, really hard, and then he has to take, he needs some downtime for himself. And he, he was that way as a kid, and sometimes we'd forget, and that's when he'd get grumpy. He still takes care of himself that way. So by Friday, when his Game Boy didn't appear, he's really, he's, he's getting really antsy. Saturday comes, and um, I went to Saturday morning training, which is was always far from me, and I would, um, I called home on my way home, and my husband knew nothing about this, because my, my husband 
was a disbeliever for a very long time about this everything that I'm teaching you. So we just really didn't even talk about it. So he knew nothing about Jack wanting a Game Boy. And I call home, and Jack answers the phone, and he says, Mom, Mom, Dad is going to pay me $100 to power wash the deck. I said, wow, Jack, that's great. So when I got home, Jack was busy power washing the deck, and you can guess how much the Game Boy cost. It was $100. So the thing that's remarkable about this story is that Jack, I'm not sure, has ever asked for a money-making opportunity, ever. And I, while I'm a very generous person, I couldn't fathom that my husband was willing to pay a 10-year-old child $100 to power wash the deck. And so I said, hey, Rich, like, what, why? Why would you do that? And he said, well, Jack came to me and asked if if I had any money-making opportunities, and I knew I wanted the deck washed, and I knew it was worth 100 bucks. so I said, sure. I mean, it did take Jack all day to do it, but in the end, Jack got his 100 bucks, and he, we went and bought his Game Boy on Sunday, and it was plenty of time for him to leave on his long-distance trip on Monday morning. So that's the story of Jack Hill, and now we're going to, I'm going to continue the story of Jack Hill, and we're going to grow through the ages, and then I'm going to break it down. So the power of intention, writing things down, you hear it all the time, but it is, it's so powerful. And if you look, this is a picture of Jack's eighth grade yearbook, and he actually had forgotten about it. We, we kind of unearthed it one day when we were cleaning out his room, and on here it says um, his sport is lacrosse, which is interesting that he would choose that since he chose all sports, or he played all sports. He played baseball and football and basketball, and he was never a soccer kid, but um, lacrosse was brand new. Tennis, he played them all. And if you look at his goals at the bottom that he wrote down, again, so powerful, was to be an All-American in any sport. And so this is his eighth grade year. And in fact, He was two-time All-American in high school playing lacrosse, and that picture on the left is him raising. They were state champions twice. Uh, This time he was captain of his team when they won the state championship his senior year. I love that photo. So that's the power of writing things down and setting your intention. And he went on to play. He wanted to be recruited. He was recruited for D1 lacrosse in college, and the picture on the right is him against Brown, which was a powerhouse in the lacrosse. I mean, this game was like a mercy game that they played Quinnipiac um, just really, really so that Brown could just get more experience. Um, But Jack scored. And Jack, as a freshman, long pole, which as you can see by the picture, long poles don't typically score because they're defense and it's very hard to maneuver a long pole such that you would score. And so... Jack Hill made it on the cover of our local magazine with that photo of um, him scoring against Brown. So Jack Hill in college, so he kept these principles going. And when he was a freshman that same year, they were playing a team in Louisville, Kentucky. His school was in in Connecticut, so they flew there. And he was rooming with an upperclassman, and the upperclassman said to him, Oh, I don't want to play. And and Jack said, why Why not? Why don't you want to play? And he said, well, because we always lose. And Jack said, what do you mean we always lose? He said, we're Quinnipiac. Like, that's what we do. We lose. And Jack said, why not us? Why, why can't we win? And Jack took that attitude out on the field, and he said it to his roommate. He said, why can't we win? Why not us? And they won. And they kept winning. And he kept saying, why not us? Why not us? And so this freshman boy, first-year player in college, walked around saying, why not us? And soon, I I was fortunate, part of my um, story, and I'll get to my story, but I went to all of his games. And, yes, I do live in Chicago, um, but I when I would be walking back to the field house with him after the games, after a winning game, the other players would be coming up to Jack and saying, hey, Hill, why not us? Why not us? And then his coach started quoting him in their before game meetings why not us why not us and they kept saying why not us and they kept winning and they kept winning and they kept winning and this picture is when we went to the NCAA finals for the first time in school history 
was because of Jack Hill introducing the concept of why not us. What did he want? Well, he came to Quinnipiac to win. That's what he came to. And even though the rest of the team didn't have that attitude, one by one by one, they achieved it. They won their games. They won their championship, the MAC championship, which got them entry into the NCAA finals, again, for the first time in school history. So now we're going to break it down. We'll go through that, and I will share my story, because my whole story of being in Relive is a better than magic story. But it's three principles. If you take nothing else from today, here are the, the very, distilled down into the basic three principles of better than magic is what do you want, how is not your job, and timing is always perfect. What I have on the bottom um, are these are tools that will help get you there. Your words and your thought matters. Your, um, you want to allow inspired actions. You want to choose happiness, stay in your joy, and you want to practice gratitude, saying thank you all day long. So what do you want is probably the hardest part for anybody, and especially if you are willing to just sit quietly and take the limits off, and those limits being, yes, the yeah, but, yeah, but I'm not thin enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not fast enough, I'm not pretty enough. I'm Whatever those yeah, buts are, if you take all those limits or the, or the negative self-talk that says, are you crazy? You'll never have enough money to do that. Are you crazy? You'll never be able to do that. This is where if you sit quietly, mute all those voices around you and just think about what do you want. If there were no limits, if there was nobody telling you you can't, if you took the limits off your own self negative talk and you said, what do I want? It's the hardest part. For some people, in Relive, we always talk about the why. Um, And the why, the why is, um, there's a a lot of it's represented on this motivation matrix. This came from a class I'm currently taking, but What do you want? Affiliation, altruism, managing people, lifestyle, intellectual challenge. It's kind of the why we do anything in life. And from this study, they found that uh, financial gain is not usually people's why. It's usually autonomy. People want to do what they want to do when they want to do it without anybody telling them what they want. Let me go back up. So when you think of what do you want, the next – so that's the hardest part, I think – And this is the part that people look at me cross-eyed because how is not your job? And when you find yourself saying, well, how am I going to do that? How am I going to have enough money? How am I going to have enough time? How am I going to be smart enough? How am I going to be fast enough to do this? Whatever it is that you want, chances are it includes something that will make you want to say, how am I going to do that? How is not your job? How is not your job? Because when you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. And that's from the book that, the Alchemist, which if you haven't read it, I highly recommend. It's, it's like a young adult novel teaching the principles of what I'm talking about and doing it in a story form, and it's pretty awesome. So what do you want and how is not your job? And then timing is always perfect because when you get that thing that you said you wanted, even though it may not arrive in the time you said you wanted it, you'll realize that when it does arrive, it is perfect timing because it couldn't have happened any other way, meaning you really weren't ready in other parts of your life. The pieces weren't in place for you, for you to enjoy it fully. I'll share with you my, my story of Better Than Magic is I started my company. I had a, a traditional business. I started it when I was 25. I had worked with somebody uh, for somebody prior to starting my own company. I was earning $10,000 a month in commissions, they had a lot of rules, and they were taking my customers away. Um, they were taking away relationships that I had built over several years, and that that's really why I left. People think that I did it because I wanted all the commissions myself, and I didn't actually care why they thought, but I, I, I resigned. And my boss, because I resigned in integrity, and my my last month in business with for that other company was my second highest month since I'd been there. I trusted that my company was going to pay me everything I was due, and they did. My old boss remained my mentor, for my, and I went into competition with him. Um, he remained my mentor 
forever. And I thought, okay, now what? Now what am I going to do that's going to pay me a lot of money? Come on, I'm 25 making $10,000 a month, loving selling. And who's going to give me a lot of responsibility? And someday I'm going to have kids, and I knew that I wanted to be home with them after school the way my mom was home with us after school. And that left, I just figured, okay, me, right? The American dream. If you own your own company, you call the shots, you get to do what you want to do. And I, that was my answer. So I started my own company. I honestly never had it in mind that it was going to be as big as it, as it got. I grew it to $15 million in gross annual sales. I had 18 salespeople. I had four or five people working in my office. I had a 6,000 square foot showroom at the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. I loved everything I did. But then I started having babies. And by the time I had been in business for 10 years, um, that's when Jack Hill was born. He was he was born actually a couple weeks after my 10 year anniversary. And there was a big party. Um, there was a big party. And I was very pregnant. And because I didn't know these principles that I'm teaching you, my mantra that summer before this massive party was, I don't want it to rain and I don't want to give birth. I don't want it to rain and I don't want to give birth. <laughs> and it rained and I had picked a rooftop um, location out, out in the open air. I spent you know a week scouring the perfect location. Not only did it rain, it, it didn't rain until – five o'clock when everybody was leaving the show and they would they were heading over. So my huge party, there was, you know, a handful of diehards that showed up and then it dried off enough for the band to come out and then it rained again and the band had to go on. So you'll see in these other things um, in terms of the tools in your tool belt, since I didn't have these tools at that point, I, I actually didn't give birth until a week later. So that part was good. But I so I'm going along. I'm running my company. I'm I'm earning a lot of money. I and but my business is taking me away from my boys, which is really where I wanted to be. And then I was introduced to Relive, and I most of you probably have heard this part. But I so when I was introduced to Relive, I wasn't thinking of a. Um, I didn't need any more money. There was not another minute in my day. This is the part where so you guys just heard the backstory. But, and this is the part where I normally start out. Um, but I love the stories in Relive. And I did jump into business that same day, really just so I could help people. And I started helping people, started earning $1,000 a month pretty quick. And it took me a couple years. And it was it, um, a key person in my organization, Kathy. She's my right hand. She had been with me for 15 years. And she literally was my right hand. And she resigned because she and her family moved to Michigan. So I knew it was coming. She gave me nine months' notice. When she left, it was back to me. I had to do her job, too. And I was, it was back to me. That's working 60, 70, 80-hour weeks. That's because Kathy was gone. And she had, she had a, a, left a big hole. And that's when I, by the end of that summer, I came home early one day, early 5.30 for me. And um, my boys were playing. They didn't even look up. And they said, hi, Dad. And that's when my heart broke. And I made the decision six weeks later to retire, close my company, be home with my boys, do relive around their schedule so that I could be that mom that I had wanted to be the minute I started my company. And that's my better than magic story because that is, I never, ever, 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 ever would have guessed that I would be where I am and the reasons for it. Um, I, I wouldn't have said, okay, at 25, I'm going to start my own company so I could be home with my kids, but my company's going to grow too big and it won't allow me to be home with my kids. So then I'm going to get introduced to network marketing and that's going to be my answer. That's going to allow me to be home with my kids. So that's where the trust comes in and that's where the gratitude is. And that's where the, the deliberateness and the realization of what you have and where it came from, because all goodness does flow from God. I recognize that, and that's why timing is always perfect because timing is his perfect. His timing is always perfect. May not be our timing, but believe me, when it gets there, it's sweeter than anything you could have imagined. So we talked about this motivation matrix already, and this. So part of what I had told Jack that week, and what is probably most important here, is for you to allow 
what you said you wanted to flow to you, for you to manifest it, for it to land in your lap, you need to stay in your joy. This is an emotional guidance scale. It's from Abraham Hicks, who I'm, I'm a huge fan of Abraham Hicks, but if you just Google emotional guidance scale, lots of people do them. It's essentially a list of emotions and where they rank. And obviously, the higher the emotion, the more open you are and the, the faster what you want can flow to you. Because it's not, it's not that there's some person, thing, that's blocking you from getting what you want. You are blocking you. And so, like I told Jack that week, he had to stay in his joy. He had to be nice to his brothers. He had to be nice to me. And that's what allowed his Game Boy to show up. That's what allowed him to have the inspired action for his Game Boy to show up. And so when you're in the lower realm of anger and revenge and jealousy and insecurity and fear, all of those are such heavy emotions, and they will keep away anything that you said that you wanted because you're just not allowing it to be through. And... I always, when I coach people and if they hate their job and they want a new job, then the idea is to find something you like about your current job, the one that you hate, but find something that you like, whether it's the trees on the way to work are beautiful, whether the coffee that they serve in the lounge is exceptionally tasty, whether the woman that greets you when you walk in the door smiles, whatever it is, you find those little bitty things that will make you smile, and that in turn is what will attract a new job to you. Like I said, I'll stay on for Q&A at the end because I'm guessing a lot of this is like a, a, a foreign language to you. So it, this all, it all stems from your awareness. You need to be aware of what you're thinking, doing, saying because you do get more of what you think about. So it's important for you to be deliberate with your words and your actions, to stay in your joy, to talk about what you do want instead of what you don't want. We use this expression all the time in Relive. Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So practice being right about what you want to be right about. For instance, you're planning a big picnic on Saturday and it rains. And you say to your best friend, see, I told you it was going to rain. Okay, who would want to be right about that? As opposed to saying, I want clear skies and sunshine. That is, that's such a basic example. My, My oldest one morning, it was a rainy Monday morning, and he came slamming down the stairs, and he said, this day is going to stink. And again, I taught this to all my boys. I said, you're right. You're right, Nick. It's going to stink. But you know what? You have the power to change it. You have the, the power to think otherwise. And he literally, when he got, he was, he was in high school. He literally, when he got to high school, he called me and he said, you're right. I decided on the, my way to school that I was going to change it and that I was going to have a really good day. And I was all stressed out because I didn't finish my math homework. But it turns out we had a substitute teacher, so he didn't even need to turn his math homework in. And that's the way that it works. When you stay in your joy, I'm not saying that because he changed his attitude that all of a sudden he had a substitute teacher. I'm just saying it all flows. It all flows together. So practice being right about what you want to be right about. It's it's so easy to say, see, I told you you were going to get hurt. See, I told you it was going to rain. See, I told you you were going to forget your keys. Okay, do you really do you really want to be right about that? Or do you want to remind somebody in love to remember to bring their keys? To wrap up on a sweater when if it's if they're going outside and wear their hat and gloves when it's cold. That's the higher scale on the emotional guidance scale. So we talked a a little bit about this, but don't, not, and know, and should are four words that if you're going to be really deliberate and you're going to attract what you want, you need to talk about what you do want instead of what you don't. So when I was telling you about my party and telling you that I didn't have these tools, so my mantra being I don't want it to rain and I don't want to give birth, I don't want it to rain, I don't want to give birth, uh, those words kind of cancel those like they're not heard out there 
in the in the universe. And uh, so if you say, I don't want it to rain, what the universe really hears is, I want it to rain, I want it to rain, I want it to rain. Again, not suggesting that any one of us has the power to make it rain or not rain. It's just about talking about what you do want instead of what you don't want. And I mentioned Louise Hay, my guru in the beginning. She is a huge believer in the word should and how when you use the word should, it implies blame. There's so much blame that comes with that word. I was talking to a young man recently, and he's having a really rough go, and he um, must have said should five times in the first 10 minutes. And so and I could just feel the heaviness as he was saying this. And, and I said, so change that word. And you could, there's a really old-fashioned word you could change it to, and you could say, ought, I ought to, I ought to go to the store right now. Or you could change it to the word could, and it almost becomes more inspiring, like, oh, my gosh, I should exercise, I should exercise. Instead, if you said, I could exercise, it's, there's almost hope in that. I could exercise. I could exercise. And so when you are being aware and when you are being deliberate, these are the words that when I say, if I'm tempted to say I don't want, I pause. I mean, this is, this is practice. This is a habit that if, you're, if you choose to go this route, really magic will happen in your life. But when you hear yourself starting to say, I don't want, pause and ask yourself what I do want. What do I want? And it's not always the opposite because you could say, I don't want to go up. It doesn't mean you want to go down. Sometimes it could be, I'd rather go sideways. But if you stop and think and be aware of your thoughts and let this become practice and a habit, you will be amazed. You will be amazed at hearing how other people do it too, but you'll be amazed what you were able to attract easily and in perfect timing into your life. And I should, um, I'm, I'll talk about the four agreements in a minute, but going back to the how, because that's the toughest principle for people to understand. And usually, nine times out of ten, when you talk about money, The money is the how. So when you say, I want a new car, but I don't have enough money. I want a master affiliate order, but I don't have enough money. Money is the how. And so if you if you leave that out, that but, right? Yeah, but yeah, but I don't have enough money. Yeah, but I'm not fast enough. Yeah, but I'm not good enough. And you just stick with what you want. Again, the way that it comes to you will surprise even you. I In one of my classes, one of my students didn't have a car. And her friend would ask her, you know, hey, will you, and she was embarrassed that she didn't have a car. And her friend would call her and invite her places, and um, this woman knew she could, never could meet her friend. And so eventually the friend said to her, hey, what, what's up? I keep asking you to go with me someplace and you keep saying no. Like, is it me? Do you not like me anymore? Do you not want to be friends? And this woman said, I would love to meet you, but I don't have a car. And this friend said, wow, you should have asked for that. I, you know, I have plenty. So for the rest of that year, this woman was driving a candy apple red convertible around because her friend said, I have plenty of cars. You certainly can use one of mine for as long as you need it. And so, but if the, if the first woman had just stated up front, I want a car, then she, that's, actually it was, she started this class and it was when she started this class and she said, I, I want a car. That's the way that it appeared. And again, you would have never guessed, wow, I don't have a car. I think I'll say I want a car, and then my friend will lend me one of hers. It, usually, it doesn't happen that way. When I was starting, and it's all deliberate action, right? You're getting, you're getting in the flow of this. When I wanted to watch Jack's games, I'm in Chicago. He's in Connecticut. I knew how was not my job. I trusted that it was going to happen, but I took deliberate action myself meaning my my idea 
was that I was going to t- – I have a lot of friends on the East Coast – that I was going to poll my friends and find somebody who knew somebody who was a snowbird and who was gone most of the winter, and I would just house sit for them. That was my idea. So there's my deliberate action, right? You can't just sit and wait for this to happen. You need to do something toward what you want, and this is the inspired part. This is, this is the inspired part. This is what caused Jack Hill to ask his father for a money-making opportunity. That's the inspired action. So against his, what he, he just never did it, but he was inspired to do it by some magic. And so me asking my friends, who did they know that was a snowbird? A friend that I had said, wow, we have an empty apartment next to ours. You're welcome to stay there as much as you want. Okay, that was still like four hours from the game. So that was a very nice gesture, but not, it was not close enough for what I wanted. But I knew the energy was swirling around me. I knew that I was on the right track. I knew the energy was swirling around me, and I kept going. And then my best friend from college, and I really didn't pay attention to geography. I went to school in Maine. My friend lives in New York. This was in Connecticut. I didn't spend any time in Connecticut. So I wasn't really, like I said, not, I wasn't paying attention to geography. But my best friend in New York said, well, why don't you just make me your home base, and, I will, and you can stay here for the games. And it turns out she was only two hours away, and that there was a train from Central um, Grand Central Station directly to where the game was. So she made it easy. Most often she ended up driving me to the game. We went together. She let me borrow her car, whatever. But that is the way that I got to see Jack's games because I set the intention that I wanted to go to all of Jack's games, and that's the way that it works. The four agreements. I, I include the slide just because I love that book. That book was life-changing for me. All of these things are tools that help you stay in your joy and help you be in the right frame of mind to receive that which you said you wanted. So the four agreements are be impeccable with your word. That means no gossiping. Be nice. Be kind. Be of integrity. Do what you say you're going to do. Mean what you say. That's number one. Number two, don't take anything personally. Yes, he, he uses the word don't in a couple of these, but that's okay. Don't take anything personally. That is so hard to do. Again, it takes practice because you have to know that whatever it is that you're making up is just a story. I mean, think of it. If you walk up to a group of, of people and they're chatting and you walk up and they stop chatting, it's really easy to go to that dark side, to those heavy emotions and say, wow, they must have been talking about me. What, what must they have been saying? Ooh, and that just feels icky, and that brings you down on the guidance scale, and that helps whatever it is that you said you wanted to slow down or stop altogether. It can't get to you. So don't take anything personally. If you're going to go there and you walk up to a group of people and they are talking and they stop talking the minute you arrive, instead, if you want to make up a story, because whatever you tell yourself, it's going to be a story, make up a good one. Let it be that you say, Oh, my gosh, they must be planning a surprise for me. I can't wait to see what's in store for me. I'm going to be delighted. So don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions. There it is. There's that story again. You're assuming that they're talking about you. And the old adage of when you assume, you make an ass of you and me. So leave the assumptions out. Those are all stories anyway. If you're, gonna, if you're going to make up a story, make it be a good one and always do your best. Always do your best. And sometimes, my dad used to say, sometimes good enough is perfect. It, it is what it is. You can do what you can do. And then you have to be happy with that. Again, staying high on that emotional guidance scale so that your desires can actually show up in your life. And you want to find your joy. That's the whole thing in this. You want to find your joy. I had a coach once who was engaged. And she and her fiancé were not getting along at all. And she decided that she would start writing down three things that she liked about him. And some days, if when, they were, when they really weren't getting along, the best she could do was, wow, 
the buckles on his shoes were really shiny today, or, you know, his coat was zipped properly, or I liked the way he combed his hair instead of, wow, he was really loving to me. But so some days they were really, really basic stuff, and she would wrote them, wrote them down. She went so far as to write them on a whiteboard so he actually could see them. I think that's really, that was really bold of her, but she, she did that. And she said what happened is that so she's writing these nice things down every day, and he would read them, and he'd say, wow, you noticed that? wow, you notice that? And he was, he just got kinder and kinder and kinder, and they did get married, and so far they've lived happily. It's not after yet, but they've been living happily because she could appreciate the nice things about him, and she turned her attention, was deliberate in her words, she didn't make assumptions, and she picked all the good stuff to focus on because, again, you get more of what you think about. So with Relive, we, I know I didn't include any stories except mine and Jack Hill's, but this was really all about you and your mindset today and, and my desire to empower you, to inspire you, to take deliberate action, to write down what you want, to take the limits off what you want. And where, where it's involved in Relive is you get to decide. I remember doing a mat school a training and I remember sitting at lunch with somebody right after, and she said, okay, so tell me where you were nine months ago and what you were thinking because I, in nine months I want to be an ambassador. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. Um, but I remember I became an ambassador a few months after I decided I was ready to be an ambassador. I knew when I was home with my kids, when I had closed my company, I wanted to be home with my kids, and I worked my business around them. And then at some point they – didn't need me as much, and I decided I was ready. And I decided I was ready in November, and by the end of February, I was mass- I was uh, an ambassador. Um, so it and it's the perfect storm, right? Sometimes it happens that way. Sometimes you grow your business, and it's just so steady, 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 and it's inevitable that it happens. And sometimes it it's almost a fluke when all when it's a perfect storm of everything happening all at once. But you get to decide. You get to decide how you want to be in Relive. You get to decide what you want from Relive, whether you want to be a master affiliate, whether you want to be involved, whether you want to grow a great big business and help a lot of people. It goes back to the beginning. What what do you want? So get back with the person who invited you today. They can give you more information to help you get to what you want. And staying on that emotional guidance scale, you want to love yourself enough to lead and live and enjoy a healthy lifestyle. That is the end of Better Than Magic. I'm going to stop the recording and then I'll open up the lines and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mayor. It was great. Mayor, this was really good information. Mayor, can you hear me? Mayor, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can I can hear you, but I don't know if Mayor is silent again. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay. now I'm now I'm unmuted. So I was just talking to myself again. So yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah, that is great. Okay, yay! If you hit star six, you can unmute yourself. Okay, I um, I have kind of a mind shift question. So you okay. said decide what you want, um, and then you said a lot of times the money is how you get what you want. How do you? shift from think money is what you want so going back to jack's example right jack didn't say i want a hundred dollars to buy a game boy jack said i wanted a game boy now in this instance 
he needed a hundred dollars to get the Game Boy, but that was not what he was focused on. He was focused on what he wants. He wanted a Game Boy. The woman without a car, she didn't want the money to buy a car. She wanted a car. And so often, and it, it it's sometimes it's like it's it defies belief, but that's what I'm asking you to do is to right. focus on what you want because you could say, I want to. Um, I want I, to go on vacation. Okay. I want to go on vacation. Actually, this was somebody in my class too. I want to go on vacation, and um, it turns out her brother for the first – I mean, so she's saying this to herself, and her brother for the first time ever said, hey, we just rented a house in Florida. Do you want to join us? Wow. So you really – when you – Allow yourself to want what you want without worrying, right? Worrying is one of those heavy emotions. Worrying right. about how it's going to arrive. When it does arrive, you'll say, wow, wow, look, I got what I said I wanted and I didn't have to pay for it. Money oh, money is not what got me there. And, and sometimes maybe it would be. Maybe if you said you wanted a vacation and maybe like one time – this is this was the time that I think my husband really started clicking over. Is we got a bill in the mail, and and it and it um, was like the six thousand dollar bill that we weren't expecting. And my husband said, "How are we going to pay for this?" And I I said, "How's not my job?" And he got really mad. <laughs> well, that's all. That's really nice, Mayor, but we still have to pay this bill. Like, where are we going to get the six thousand dollars? And so I had to do my best, especially when we were at odds like that, to stay in my joy, to stay in my trust. And a few days later, we received a letter from one of our other creditors, out of the blue, lowering our interest payments and the savings, six thousand dollars. Wow. So that's. <laughs> That's the awareness, right? You need to you need to have that awareness so you're putting two together so those things together so you're saying, "Wow, thank you." Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Because that that truly is what I want. I want to be out of debt and I want to be right. self re Those are You want to be out of debt and you want to be self what? Say the other thing. Self-reliant. Okay. So I would focus on the self-reliant part cuz debt is such a a heavy, heavy word, and there's money involved in that, and I right. want to be self-reliant. And if you focus on being self-reliant and, and what that feels like, then, um, I mean, one thing you can do, I mean, there's lots of different exercises just to have you focus. So if you if you carried around a little notebook or even in your phone, if you're an electronic person and you, and you put it in your phone, every time you save some money, like you clipped a coupon, you found a penny on the street, Somebody gave you ten bucks that you weren't expecting. You write it in. You write it down. So that's a fun thing that that helps your awareness, being on all the, a, a notice of all the money that's coming in. Another exercise that I have done a few times, um, and it, it honestly got a little overwhelming for me. But people who are really into it, this could be really fun. Is if you, again, this is all to shift your mindset to help you with your. Um, the way that you're, what you're aware of is if today you had to spend a dollar, what would you spend a dollar on? And then, and there's apps, I think, that you can find that will help you with this. And tomorrow you're going to spend $2. And what are you going to spend it on? Every day you double it. So eventually you are spending $100,000 in a day. And what are you going to spend that $100,000 on? Uh. And, and at some point for me, I realized, you know what? I really like my life. <laughs> I'm I'm very grateful for what I have, and I'm very happy with where I'm at. Right. You can also say I'm open and receptive to all the goodness and abundance the universe has to offer so that you're – or you say this or something better. I want to be reliant and or something better. I want to be reliant for the highest good of all concerned. I mean, these are all the things that run through my head yeah. as I as I'm, as I practice this. Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, that is my top thing. I want to be self-reliant, but it's not the only thing I want, right? I want to be self-reliant so that I can be generous, so that I can... Okay, so the, self, the self-reliance the self is um, the how. 
if you keep going, what you really want to be is you really want to be generous. Okay. Right. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, and you could, and I want to, I, I want to be generous. If you, if there's still because in there, I want to be generous because I want to change people's lives. Okay. I want to change people's lives. So if you keep going up that scale and you focus on what's at the top, you know, being generous is a very subjective term, right? And that's where you need to be grateful for whatever level of generosity you are able to give at this moment and be, and be grateful that at this moment, this is enough and it feels really good. Instead of looking forward and saying, well, you know, I can give $100 today, but you know what? I'd really rather give 1000 I had, I had, I, I bake cookies for college students and I have a friend who is very generous and there are a number of charities that I support. And the other day out of the, and she asked me to send cookies to her niece and I started doing that cause I love doing it. And I know her niece and I like her niece and blah, blah, blah. And out of the blue the other day, she said, well, I'd really like to send money to, you know, one of your she favorite charities. So just let me know which one. So that enables me to be generous, right? I'm doing something that I love. I'm baking cookies. And out of that gets born uh, a donation to my favorite charity, uh, independent of, I mean, yes, it's tied to me, I suppose, but I didn't set out to bake cookies so that my charity could be supported. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. I, I guess I just need to keep following the line because I am. I'm stuck on the money thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's very, very freeing when you let go of the money. <laughs> hard, hard to do, but it's it's so freeing. It's so freeing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? I love talking about this stuff, love teaching this stuff, love living this stuff. I mean, how many times have you guys driven somewhere? Like my drive to when I on Saturday trainings, there's always there's so many red there were so many traffic lights that I I I've lost count. Like I tried so many times to count how many traffic lights. And so I would set the intention and I would say out loud, "Please, I would like green lights. Please light my way green today." And each time I got a green light, I'd say, thank you. Thank you. I say thank, I say thank you all day long. An idea pops into my head, I say thank you. I'm able to run up the stairs and my knees are fine, I say thank you. <laughs> you get more of what you focus on. Anybody else? Love the questions. <clears throat> All right. If there if there really is, is nothing else, I'll uh, the Mayor, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, Roger. Okay. So when you find yourself in that second column, and I think you probably answered this um, with your four agreements, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. When you find yourself in that second column of doubt and despair and depression and blah 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 how do you find that joy well when i get there um and i will sit in a chair and i will say to myself what do i want right now i feel really yucky i'm really yucky sometimes i'm crying and i say what do i want right now and then I just kind of in my head say, do I want to call a friend? Do I want to eat some chocolate? Do I want to eat? Do I want to exercise? Do I want to sit here and cry? And if you, if you, when you start this practice of hearing your own intuition, your gut will tell you, your, your, the physicality will tell you that, you'll, that you hit on the right answer. And you say, so I'm feeling really yucky. Do I want chocolate? And you'll feel the answer in your body. And, and you'll, learn, you'll learn to know what that feeling is. So as you develop it, it will become more natural. Like when I used to hire salespeople, um, usually because we covered 11 states in the Midwest, usually I was hiring on site, so I was somewhere else. 
and I could feel it in my belly the minute literally that I opened that hotel room door and met that person, whether that person was the right person or not. Like I knew it in that instance. And there were so many times that I went against my gut because they had the right answers, they had whatever, and I hired them and then they didn't work out. So it's the same thing when you learn that, you know, your toes may tingle, you get a fluttering in your belly, you'll, it, you'll smile, you'll smile. And then you'll know that that's the right answer to do what it is to get you out of that. And the other thing is to focus on something good. Like the other morning when I woke up, I was so, so comfortable in my bed, like so comfortable, so comfortable. And I lied there thinking, wow, I am so comfortable. I'm so I'm so comfortable right now. I'm I'm warm. I'm dry. I'm clean. I'm safe. I'm all these things. And thinking back to that right now makes me smile. So when you find yourself getting into that yucky side, find that happy place. Your your newest happy place. Your newest thing that you did, however small. Like lately for me, I know this won't help you, but lately for me, it's the the magnificence of the autumn trees. They are so beautiful. I also keep a gratitude journal every night. Like for years and years and years, I mean literally more than 10 years. Every night I write down five things. And for me, I used to say I'm grateful for, and then I thought that seemed a little highfalutin to me. I, I, that was just me. Um, I, I am grateful, but I said five great things today. And so what happens when you say, when you know that you're going to do that journal and it is like brushing my teeth. It's, I mean, it's that I do it every single night, five great things today. I, when you do that, you end up going through your day looking for those things that you're going to write down and you, and you say, wow, That red tree was so beautiful. I say, okay, that's going on my list tonight. Wow, that person made me laugh. That cashier was really nice to me today. My coffee was the perfect temperature. I don't drink coffee. My tea was the perfect temperature. I had the perfect amount. I had the perfect timing of getting to this place on time. whatever, Whatever it is, and it doesn't matter how small it is, this is just you and your journal. And you write those things down. And, and so I think, Roger, this is still going back to your question. I think if you did that and made that really a habit, something that a ritual that you do every night. I am on my knees. Like I'm on my knees every night, right? I say my prayers. I write my, in my journal. And um, that is what I do before I go to bed. And so when you do that, I think what happens is the depression, the incidence of it will lessen and or the magnitude of what hits you will lessen and will be easier for you to be able to sit in that chair and say, what do I want? Maybe, maybe the depression is, is too much for that simple question of what do I want? Will chocolate solve it? Probably not right now. But maybe if the gratitude journal kicked in and you spent your day looking for good things to write down, the, the rest will subside and take care of itself. And then the things that you say you want will start flowing to you. And, and it, it's, a, it's an upward spiral instead of a downward spiral. Does that make sense? It does. And I know, at least for me, and I probably speak for almost everybody, if not everybody on the call, that this has been an amazing training and this will definitely go on my, my list for tonight of things that were amazing today. Oh, thank you. And you know what will go on my list is all of you being here and the questions that you've asked asked me. So thank you. Hey, Mayor. Yes. It's Tammy. Can I just say one thing real quick? Hi. Uh You know, I just... I just want to say how every single time I hear Mayor give this training, I am so inspired by it. And um, that's why I always keep coming back, not just because I love her, but because I love her words and I love the way she lives. Um, Some of you may not know this, but when I vacation, I vacation at Mayor's house. Um, That is my idea of a vacation is spending time with Mayor. And I have seen her live these principles every together. 
<clears throat> Emmy, you're going to make me cry. Thank you so much for that. Hi, Mir. Uh, this is yeah. uh, Lon in San Jose. Hi, Lon. Hi. Thank you for all that. Uh, just hey, a quick question, because it's amazing, you know, put this in practice. But I was wondering, you know, as far as like where we talk to our prospects, uh, do you incorporate some of this? Because somehow we get stuck because they're in the opposite situation, you know, that they're either, you know, do we say, you know, you know, because they don't know what they want, like you know, they want to get well, but then they don't want relief. And you know, do you add some of this? Um, sure. Well, yes, because you, you say, what do you want? Um, and you can say, are you open to a solution? Okay. I, I, I tend to do that more because now you're asking permission and now you're giving um, the other person a say in it as opposed Mayor? to just viewing for a th yes, Tammy. You, you were cutting in and out. And are you still there? You're talking about Tammy. Yeah, so I'm going to keep going with Lon. Mayor, can you hear me or did I? Uh, yes, now did I can hear me? you, Tammy. I'm... You kind of cut okay. out at the end. But are you, are you still there? You need to Okay. Now so, you're there. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm here. Can it's you hear me? You yes, and Lon, I'll, I'll yeah, come back okay, to you. Okay, so I just wanted not mean to interrupt. I just wanted to say that I wanted to see Hamilton and I did not know how that was going to happen and we were putting our names into lotteries to watch it together and then something else happened. So Mayor, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but Yeah, I can hear you, Tammy. I just want to say that Okay, I just want to say that we put it out there, Mare and I, and there was one day that she called me and she said, we're going to Hamilton. And I just, I like started crying. I was so happy. And it, it was, and it came about in a way that none of us would have ever dreamed. Um, and so I'm just letting you know that we saw Hamilton together because we put it out there and then we waited for it to come. And, and Mare has blessed me so much with the things, things that she's taught me. And um, so my my vacations are her special um, because I watch this and it helps me every day in my life when I live these principles. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm sure you've blessed a lot of people by saying that on this call today. So thank you. And um, I'm going to go back to Lan, Lon and um, in terms of saying it to prospects is this also works actually with a, a, a somebody who's like spouting off and being really negative is if you just pause and you say, wow, what do you want? What would help you right now? And so if they say they want to get healthy, you can say, are you open to a solution? And they'll say, you know, what do you got? Well, I've been with a company and I'm, you know, happy to share what I know. Now's not a good time. You know, let's get together. And so you give them the full, the full, you know, uh, my favorite line is, is you deserve to hear about it the way I heard about it. You deserve to hear about it the same way that I heard about it. And then you set them up for, like, I love the Thursday night call. The Thursday night short and sweet call is, um, like, such an easy way to introduce somebody to Relive. They get five stories in 15 minutes, and, um, and, and, and that's a good way to gauge. Hey, do you have 15 minutes? And then you get on the call with them. And so what do you want? You want to talk to new people. You, you, Lon, want okay. new prospects. You want to help people. You want new customers. You want people who can be helped. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Makes sense. Okay. Mayor, also, this, this week we have our Wednesday opportunity meeting. Um, Elizabeth Hill is doing it this week. And I Yay, think we, we love Elizabeth Hill. Talk yeah. about joy. Like if you go, she, um, she's she got a picture of her that I've seen recently of her you dancing with her husband. Know that I am good. So beautiful. Yeah. So yes, yeah. Wednesday night, 7.30. Same, same dial in information that you have here is uh, Wednesday night with Elizabeth Hill. Yeah. Thank Half you for that, Jen. Her. Great way to introduce new people and then get people on Thursdays. Um short and sweet call. And then next Wednesday is mayor and next Saturday we'll be back here for training. So um, it's actually me doing training next week, I believe. Awesome. Thank you for that, Jen. Thank you. Anybody else? Any, any last questions? 
This is Lyra Hobbes, Mira. I've never heard Hi, Lyra. Hi, Ed. I've never heard you speak on this. And I must say, this was probably the most um, insightful training and all encompassing training on thought on our thought world that I've heard. And it's not the first time I've heard it, but I it has really ministered to me personally. And I just want to say thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, and I'm, I'm glad you were here to hear it. You know, I think, I think people hear things when they're ready. You know, you could, you could hear the same thing of what I said today. You could hear it 10 more times, and until you're ready to hear it or until one of the pieces is, makes sense in your life, it, Absolutely. it's a nice word. Yeah. So, so go out and practice it. That's the big part is practicing it. Just, you know, start simply and just start being aware. Just start being aware. Mm -hmm. Start you. being aware. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? I love doing this. I love your all being here. I appreciate you and your questions. And uh, go forth and and uh, live a happy life. And you will. Then that happiness will just ripple out amongst the people around you. And that's just a really really nice way to live. So thank you, everyone. Thank See you, you next time. Thanks, Mayor. I love you. Bye. Bye.